On this edition of Independent Sources, Citizens on Patrol, the rift between the NYPD and some community groups grows as they ask for a greater role in policing their neighborhoods. And Treasured Island, refocusing public attention on the continued environmental degradation and military occupation of the Puerto Rican island, Vieques. Those stories and more coming up on Independent Sources. Welcome to Independent Sources, bringing you news from New York's ethnic and immigrant communities. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. There's a growing call from some community action groups in the city to be a greater part of the NYPD's crime reduction efforts. While many of the group's leaders laud the city's lower crime rates, they claim that their work is going somewhat unsung in this narrative. They've called on Mayor Bill de Blasio to recognize their efforts and perhaps use some of their methods in crime prevention. But so far, there has been no movement in that regard. I spoke to Andre Mitchell, the CEO and founder of Men Up Inc., one of the groups appealing to the mayor. Andre, in an article in the Amsterdam News, uh, you were uh, quoting as saying that the NYPD needs to acknowledge and utilize tested and proven effective methods that have reduced inner city violence nationwide. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some examples of what you're talking about? Well, thank you for asking. I'm the executive director of a community-based organization entitled Man Up Incorporated. Mm -hmm. And so we're one of the city agencies we're fortunate to have been trained um, in violence interruption um, via uh, a very successful data-driven model that comes from Chicago, Illinois, mm -hmm. called Care Violence. And so in this particular uh, this training, we are trained as, as agencies to be able to employ and deploy community members um, in very high areas where violence is most prone, uh, those that we consider credible in those areas. And we find it to be very effective. We, we use these individuals who come from that lifestyle, who have been there and done that. Um, and we put them back into areas where they're most popular and have high influence over some of the people who may now be engaged in negative behaviors. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of it is to get to them before the police department does, before they commit the next crime. And in doing so, we find that it's become very effective. We are now um, are located throughout the city. We're in 18 different uh, precincts in the city of New York right now. And those... Um, agencies that are on the ground doing this type of work has, has been reporting very high success over these sort so of So let me get periods. this straight. You work in a, at precincts or in the neighborhood where the within precincts the are? Precincts within the, the precincts that the neighborhoods are, we, there are different hot spots okay. within those precinct areas. For example, we're in East New York in Brownsville, Brooklyn, with the 75th precinct and the 73rd precinct. Mm -hmm. um, that's where they patrol. Mm -hmm. Inside of those areas are hot spots. And so, so to be clear, mm -hmm. you're not working with the NYPD. No, you're just working sir. Alongside. alongside. Okay. We, we act as a different approach to crime. Our approach is more public health driven. And so for us, we find it and we treat it as a, like violence as a disease. Mm -hmm. So the police department has an approach to do so. And in fact, they do their job. We have as a community agency, our approach to doing mm -hmm. so. Ours is more public health versus well, well, public isn't safety. That, isn't that potentially dangerous uh, mm -hmm. for, for your members? Yeah, very dangerous uh, work. Exactly. So tell us so what precautions you've taken to make sure that, mm -hmm. you know, they're not victims themselves? I, well, that's a good question. I mean, the point of the matter is, again, we take people who are from the communities themselves, so they're more familiar with the areas from which we canvass. So that in itself gives them an edge up over the things that may take place. These are individuals who have prior experience in living lives like street activity, lives of crime in the past. And we have actually given them a second chance. So by coming into our agency, we give them very intensive training. Mm -hmm. Everyone is trained thoroughly and have to actually pass exams where they have to do well. Um, and then before then, we, before we put them out on the street corner, we make so that they are prepared for the like dangers that you speak of. But by no means are we playing the danger down okay. because we have inroads. 
we actually go in much, much further than the police department. Mm -hmm. We go actually in where they can't go because we know the community. Mm -hmm. Now, you said you, you want the NYPD to give your organizations and others like it yes. some credit for the reduction of crime. How so? This is the safest summer in the last 20 years. And so what happens normally is they give credit to the police department for bringing down the crime rate in those areas. And we are overlooked. And there are do, a lot of, do you have uh, empirical data? You have yes, proof that? very much so. Okay, give us... Yo, well, if we look within those precincts from which we are placed where we're working, you will notice that in those very hot spots where our agencies are working within, a reduction in certain high, what we call high rates or, or more popular crimes like homicides and shootings. We focus on those two main categories versus the other categories because we find that to be the most important. So, yes, the, the data would speak for itself. Um, we have actually used compare and compare, uh, comparison pin maps that we, um, we look at from NYPD statistics from Comstats, and it tells us that we are doing most effective work. I mean, we literally count the days in the areas from which we are based. Mm -hmm. How many days we go without a shooting or how many days of peace that we enjoy. And so that's our daily way of being aware of that we are doing an effective job. Mm -hmm. But then ultimately when we ask for the for the maps to compare our data with the map, the pen maps of the police of the precincts, it also tells that telling story. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm just saying that everybody deserves credit. Mm -hmm. That it's not one way fit all as it relates to how do we bring down crime in this city, especially in the areas where we know violence is most prone. There's a lot of people out at work that you don't hear about or you don't see, but they are working their magic in their own little way. Mm -hmm. A lot more parents are stepping up. There's a lot more people in the community that's coming So basically forward. you're saying that the community is an active partner, participant. And always and, should be. Okay. And that's the problem where I think would exist to date, that the community is not factored into the equation when they're talking about strategies when it relates to crime reduction. Neighborhoods need to be more involved, not just in helping close cases as the NYPD would like them to, but as it relates to how do they create a, a community of peace. Mm -hmm. There's many more ways community members can participate outside of just sharing information. And so we are one of those agencies that prove that fact. Okay. Now, remember uh, years ago, or I don't know if this, this is still the case, no snitch, where, mm -hmm. where it was totally uncool to, to cooperate with the police. Mm -hmm. How have you been able to well, it still counter is, that? Well, it still is, unfortunately, a very bad stigma that's associated with that uh, practice. We, we tell community because we understand the dynamics or the dilemma that they find themselves within. Um, because at the end of the day, their families still have to live out there. And if they are the family that's known to be cooperating with the police department, it puts that family at, you know, at just a higher rates of harm. What we say, in, in addition to that, is that you don't have to do what, you know, again, you don't have to be the person that's cooperating with the police department in an investigation. You can do much more by getting out there and participating and creating activities for young people. You can be in front of the issue. You can try to get to the young people before they commit the crime, trying to find out what some of their needs are, and then try to meet those needs. That's what we do every day. And so we don't have to go into the police department and share data or information, because honestly, a lot of the information sharing is unsubstantiated, and so it's unfair. What do you mean by that? Well, it's not, if you're not a witness of a crime, if you weren't there at the time of the crime that committed, and if it's just something you heard through the, grape, okay. through the grapevine, that's unsubstantiated. Okay. You, you can't go based on that. That's someone telling someone else that this happened. That's a not friend factual. Of a friend of a friend of That's a friend. not factual. We find that, you know, if you say that through communication, it can turn, the story can turn three or four times. So what we try to do is encourage and educate community in how to take a proactive approach to crime versus a reactive approach. Mm -hmm. And we find through our work, through this way and through this method that is more effective. You don't have to be labeled um, by the community and, and by you know being the family that cooperates with the police department. You can actually be labeled by the community as being the people who are in, out in the community trying to make a difference. Those are the persons who the community seem to appreciate the most. What do you think of the mayor's reaction? I mean, he on the one hand, he wants to uh, re-ingratiate himself within the ranks of the NYPD. Yes. On the other hand, you want him to give you uh, more credit. And we, so, yes. 
Well, the mayor is, is, is one of our funding agencies. The mayor okay. does support the work that we do. Mm -hmm. We know that because his office supports us through the funding that we receive, mm -hmm. from which we are appreciative. We just want the mayor to acknowledge the fact that it is a lot more going on beyond just NYPD and their sort of formulas to deal with crime most of which is pouring more cops on a troubled neighborhood, which we find it does not work. And why, it why doesn't a, it work? Well, it creates a, a larger divide. Right now, that there is a divide between community and police, from which we understand that existed for so many years. And if we're trying to rebuild a bridge, it's difficult to sometimes pour or, or deploy community or police into areas where they're unfamiliar in terms of certain neighborhoods where they don't know how the culture of that community or the, you know, the way in which that community may thrive. And, and, and then there is, exists a problem in communication. A lot of that is more of a communication factor. What we're saying is because we are there, we're on the ground, we are on the front line, and we know that our work is working because we have the evidence that proves that our work is working, acknowledge us at, alongside others that are also doing their part. It makes a more of a holistic sort of response to the question of crime. And that way you don't you know, kind of create even a further divide. Because I can understand that he, sometimes it's, he's caught between a rock and a hard place. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we have to leave the conversation here. Mm -hmm. uh, Andre Mitchell, thanks for joining us, and good luck with the program. Thank you so much. We appreciate the opportunity. Still to come on the show, we're visiting the environmental disaster on the island of Vieques. Before that, Abby Ishola has some other news. Thanks, Gary. Here's a look at some headlines from New York's ethnic and community media. From Long Island Winds, a new organization is working to empower Latino wine industry workers on Long Island's East End. Viticultural workers will have the opportunity to participate in a program designed to promote and support their academic and professional development in the wine industry. The program was started by the Long Island Latino Vintners Association, or LILVA. It's a new nonprofit organization created to advocate quality standards for hundreds of Latino workers that work primarily in North Fork's wineries. LILVA gives an estimated 250 to 300 Latino workers an opportunity to organize and advance their positions through high school guidance, scholarships, and career opportunities. The Forward reports that the mayor's office is coming under major scrutiny following the lift of a regulation that requires Mohels to obtain written consent before performing a controversial circumcision practice. Medzitza Bape, or MBP, is a ritual that requires a Mohel to perform a circumcision on male infants, then orally suck the blood from the child's penis. In recent years, several infants became infected with neonatal herpes after undergoing the ritual. Between January 2013 and December 2014, the city enforced a short-lived attempt to regulate the ceremonies through consent forms that warn parents of risks associated with MBP. However, following lawsuits and pressure from the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community, this year, the de Blasio administration announced the city's intention to revoke the consent form regulation. The 15th annual Gladys Ricard and Victims of Domestic Violence Memorial Walk was held over the weekend. The event, also known as the Brides March, is held every September 26 to remember Gladys Ricard. Ricard was shot dead by a former boyfriend on her wedding day. Women of all ages donned wedding gowns and marched through the streets of Manhattan, the Bronx, and Queens to mourn the fatal victims of domestic violence and raise awareness about its devastating effects on families. Men also participated in the march that involved groups from several boroughs. They all eventually converged at Hostos Community College in the Bronx for a closing ceremony. The National Coalition Against Domestic Violence recently revealed that the number of reported incidents of domestic violence have declined since the passage of the Violence Against Women Act in 1994. In 2007, more than 1,600 women were murdered by intimate partners, compared to 924 women in 2012. Victims of domestic violence are encouraged to call the National Domestic Violence Hotline, 1-800-799-SAFE, or 7233, or go online to domesticshelters.org. And finally, a new exhibition will honor thousands of men and women throughout Mexico who have disappeared and lost their lives. 
co-founded by Andrea Arroyo, the exhibit titled A Tribute to the Disappeared commemorates the one-year anniversary of the disappearance of 43 students from Ayotzinapa in Mexico state of Guerrero on September 26, 2014. The project aims to bring international attention to the innocent lives lost due to injustice, war, poverty, and migration. According to the Uptown Collective, the project is comprised of three components, an online exhibition, a physical exhibition, and a series of workshops. Over 288 international artists, organizations, and collectives are participating in this project. The exhibit will be on display at the Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz Memorial and Educational Center from now through October 16th. Those were just a few headlines from the city's ethnic and community media. Independent Sources will be back right after this. Thanks for staying tuned. It's been 12 years since the U.S. Navy stopped conducting bombing practices on the island of Vieques, Puerto Rico. But the unexploded bombs that still lay along beaches are a stark reminder of the environmental, physiological, and psychological damage inflicted on residents of that island by those military exercises. The filmmaker Juan C. Davila has produced a new documentary called Vieques, The Unending Battle. He wants the film to refocus the public's attention on what he calls the ongoing struggle to truly end the military occupation of the island and return it to some semblance of its former self. So Zafi Slobrin spoke to Davila about the film. Juan, thank you so much for being in studio with us today. It's a pleasure being here. All right, awesome. So let's, uh, we're going to talk about your film in a minute, but before we do that, I want us to take a look at the trailer for the film. The Navy will cease all training on Vieques and leave the island by May 1st, 2003. <laughs> El gobierno de Estados Unidos no tiene ningún interés en ofrecer reivindicaciones a pueblos que han sido oprimidos por ellos. El gobierno de Puerto Rico también nada hacen. Las maderas que están removiendo esa bomba no es la adecuada y no se ha descontaminado ni una porque hay terreno todavía. Nos, no queremos ser desobediencia. Nos están obligando. Vamos a pelear. Vamos a luchar. Vamos a mantener la denuncia. El riesgo real es mucho más amplio del riesgo percibido de los viejeces y del país. All right, Juan, interesting topic for your film. So for those who don't know, tell us a little bit about the history of Vieques. What's happening on the island? Well, Vieques is an uh, uh, island uh, that is part of Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is really an archipelago. Puerto Rico is the islands of Puerto Rico. I don't like to refer to Puerto Rico as just one island because it consists of an island with the most uh, municipalities, but there's other two islands that uh, are part of the country, which is Vieques and Culebra. So Vieques is, uh, is an island to the east coast of Puerto Rico, and it is an island that in the 40s started to be occupied by the U.S. Navy. And uh, the U.S. Navy used uh, the island to practice uh, milita military exercises. Eventually, uh, they occupied uh, two-thirds of the island, uh, pushing uh, all this population to the middle. And uh, in one side, uh, they stored the bombs. And in the other side is where they tested weapons. They made their military exercises. They also rented uh, the area to other uh, countries to come and practice and test their own weapons and, and practice uh, their maneuvers with their own military. And, uh, and that went through many years. Uh, and from the very beginning, the U.S. Navy uh, faced a lot of opposition, a lot of resistance from the people of Vieques. Uh, but it wasn't uh, really until the 1999 when uh, a bomb uh, killed uh, an officer that was a Viequense, but even though he used to work for, mili for, for the Navy, he, was, uh, he used to work as, uh, in the OP, uh, in the observation post. And, uh, and after that happened in 1999, that bomb, uh, you know, uh, 
landed in the wrong place, people got scared because if it landed in their own observation post, uh, you know, it could at any point land in a school, it could mm -hmm. land in a hospital in Vieques. So people started to get in outrage and started committing dis civil disobedience and, st and continued what the fishermen started in the 70s where they faced uh, and, and, and in a way battle. Uh, the battleships uh, of the Navy, mm -hmm. uh, the fishermen in the 70s went out uh, and, and put their boats in front of the big uh, Navy boats to, to really uh, challenge them, right. you know. So now the, the Navy since then has left uh, Vieques, am I correct in that? Well, that's questionable, the Navy, if, if the Navy has, uh, has left or not has left Vieques, because, uh, because the thing is that uh, the terrains are still uh, under the hands of the Department of Defense. Right now, the thing is that the the the, the lands, I mean, that's the, the Department of the Interior. Interior right. Yeah. Uh, the thing is that the lands are right now administered by uh, Fish and Wildlife. So, in a way, what has happened is that uh, the U.S. Uh, the, you know, the the U.S. Navy was in make uh, testing weapons, and then they left. Uh, but who came and uh, and took the the land was uh, fish and wildlife, and this has bring a lot of controversies. Also, the navy has has not definitely left because uh, there's parts that are still res restricted. You can still perceive the presence. They are still they are not open to the public. So there's a lot of of things that Vieques are not still clear about, and you can still feel the military presence in Vieques. And uh, and that's how uh, that's the reason why we cannot say that the navy has left. Also, uh, you know, they there was this deal uh, to give back all the terrains to Viacenses, but it has been um, uh, more than ten years, and they just have given back a little part. And uh, and really, there's no there's no in, you can see that there's not really any intentions right now that the terrains that are occupied by fish and wildlife are going to give be given back to uh, to the Vieques as far as seems uh, things are seems to seem to go is that they're going to uh, remain uh, being administered by the Department of the Interior in this case uh, Fish and Wildlife mm -hmm. so and then Fish and Wildlife has a strong military presence there it's not like Fish and Wildlife you know you hear the name and you perceive that it's Fish and Wildlife uh, you know definitely preserving you know the fish and wildlife, you know, there are environmentalists there, right. there are, uh, you know, people who are saving the animals, the the nature, the plants that are in the area, but when you go to the area that was occupied by the Navy, you see, uh, you know, the, the way the the way the fish and uh, wildlife uh, behaves is in a very mili military way, you know, you know, you, right. you, you can see the you can definitely go to the place that was occupied by the Navy and you see an officer with a gun, you know, right. you know, in his jeep, you know, a, a military guy that the only thing is the, he, he has a label here that says Fish and Wildlife and not U.S. Navy. U.S. Navy, right. So you had a lot of access, I could see, you know, you, you, from just this clip here, it seemed like you had a lot of access. You saw a lot of what was going on on the island. At any point, were you ever, did you ever encounter difficulty with these uh, Fish and Wildlife officers or as you tried to put the film together? Well, yeah. Yeah, of of course. Uh, I mean, I, I I gotta admit that at, at some point, you know, they, they let us interview them. They let us. I mean, and and, and we as 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 part of of being respon uh, responsible communicators, we wanted to know their version. And then they they let us interview them, and they let us take uh, take some food, uh, you know, film some footage around uh, around certain areas. Uh, but uh, but at some point, I mean, we were uh, definitely uh, intervened by by one of their agents. We were followed other times. Uh, so yeah, so it was. Uh, I mean, they they they, they give us ju just a little bit to maybe say that they let us film and and do the stuff and let, they let us do our job. But definitely there was. Uh, the, I mean, uh, officers from Fish and Wildlife intervened with us, and uh, and officers followed us. Uh, we remember that. So yeah, there was this mm -hmm. uh, this uh, I would say um, diplomatic uh, hostility, or in a way. Right, right. Now you know, obvious question. Um, 
for you, why was it important for you to make this film? Vieques is uh, is really a, a revolution of the Puerto Rican people, you know, and and, and because the, the Puerto Rican people uh, in the whole country and in the, the diaspora united to claim that land and fight the biggest U the biggest navy in the world, and they were victorious uh, for now, uh, but they won a big battle against them. And, uh, and I always admire, you know, all that courage of, of people going inside and willing to get arrested and, and be uh, three months, six months in jail. Some, some spend more time to really fight for what they believed. But once I started really the documentary, I had no idea how many uh, things were left after the, na the Navy withdraw from the island. Uh, so, right, so the documentary turned to be more of a of a documentary to celebrate a victory, it was more of a documentary to really tell that this, that the battle of Vieques has, it has not been completed, that there's much more stuff to be done. And uh, Hence the and, name. And it's the name of the, right. of the film, yeah, Vieques, an, an endless battle, right. and, and in, a, a battle that has not been concluded yet. Okay. Uh, but we're running out of time, and I don't mean to cut you off one, but um, just so that for the audience to know, uh, where can persons who want to see the film see it? Is it available online? Well, uh, this film, uh, the plan with this, I mean, this film, uh, we have been showing it uh, in in the communities, uh, you, you know, uh, you know, it hasn't had yet like a wide release, it just has been shown uh, in small publics. Uh, we're going to be showing it in, uh, in Vieques on November. Uh, uh, this month is going to be showing in the University of Puerto Rico in Mayagüez. So it's it's been shown in in, in 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 small venues, and but basically what we want to do with this film uh, is engage into I mean be be able to show it in a place where people can discuss the subject and can discuss the matter, where we could have Q and A's after, where we can have a conversation, discuss the topic, discuss ideas, and discuss the problem. That's really the purpose with this film. That it could be a film that engages discussion. All right. Well, Juan, thank you so much for your time, and I yeah. wish you good luck. Thank you. We'll be right back. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded.